Hello, and welcome to a live Curfeffy break on D program with Carrie Smith. I'm your host, Carrie. I apologize. We're starting 30 minutes late today. We usually do a live show on D programmed on this channel every Monday and Friday at one o'clock central starting 30 minutes late today. I appreciate you guys who could make it and are here to hang out. Um, we have a lot of renovation still going on here and I had an appointment I had to take care of. So I apologize. Real life got in the way. But um, thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, especially also to people who uh, su who support us. You can do so at Locals, Patreon, here at YouTube. What's the other one? Subscribe Star. <laughs> thank you guys very much. And um, I will just go ahead and make a couple of announcements. We are, I'm going to be traveling this week. I'm going to do another fun content house with comedian Chrissy Mayer and some of her other friends. And that's going to be starting on Wednesday, coming back. Um, so I'm going to, Wednesday night, we're not going to be doing a show. Uh, we're, I might have, I actually might, if, if I'm able to, I know X-Ray Girl is going to be there. There's a lot of other streamers who are going to be there. So I might be able to do a show. I've wanted to do one with her for a while. So I might be able to put something out from the content house, which would be fun. And I'll let you guys know here on the community page, if I can do that, um, that would be excellent. Uh, but in the regular schedule is not happening for the rest of the week. There's no regular, don't expect it. If something happens, it's for, it's, it's frivolity spur of the moment. <laughs> the regular Wednesday and Friday show can't, is probably not happening. I'll just tell you now. It's Christmas season. You know, Christmas season usually is when things start to wind down. And that's not happening for me this year. I don't know about you guys, but everything's winding up. There's, uh, you know, between working on the house and family stuff and my husband's work schedule and uh, uh, my other, my gig job and just everything. It's been like, whoa, there's so much going on that I almost feel like when people are reaching out for things this month, I've had to say, I'm sorry, can we just talk about next year? <laughs> I can't. I don't know if that's you. If it is, if that's happening to you this year too. I feel for you because it's, uh, I'm like, it's supposed to be winding down. Okay. I'm going to take these boots off. Uh, I'm happy to see some familiar faces. Look at Pirate Tomsky. He's got a Christmas hat on. Pirate Tomsky. Christmas season is Carrie's season of chaos. Give it up for Pirate, one of our mods. Uh, yeah, see, he says true. It's my chill out time usually. Yeah, usually, but there's a lot going on right now. Today, in just so you know, guys know, this is still the temporary location for streaming because we have been working on renovating what is going to be my deprogram studio and office. And today, our friend is here. He is brilliant. He's a, this is what he does um, all the time. Our friend is here to help my husband with the ceiling. And so they are downstairs mudding and floating and doing all the things that my husband and I've been doing on the walls. They're doing that on the ceiling today. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Uh, let me ask you a question. I guess I should put up a poll randomly recently i've gotten two comments as feedback two different people who said the intro music on deprogrammed is that that doesn't it doesn't make them excited quite the off opposite they it said they said it was too loud and jarring what do you guys think about the intro music i've always i love it but if maybe i'm i know i'm a weirdo <laughs> So I specifically asked for something in that style from my husband and he made that song for me. And uh, let's see if I can do a, a poll here. Uh, if you think that, oh, Therese likes it. Beard likes it. Okay. You guys like it? Okay. I was like, do I need to change it? Is it bothering lots of people? Maybe it's just a coincidence that two different people share with me that it bothered them around the same time. And then I was like, wow, what if that's a lot of people? 
the cartoon freaks you out a bit. Yeah. Those, those old cartoons freak me out too. I have a fascination with them. That's an old Betty Boop bit of cartoon. And Conrad says it freaks me out a bit. Uh, the reason that I, I use that one is it's the theme of that particular, well, first of all, almost all of the Betty Boop cartoons are in the public domain because there was this whole, they lost the rights to it and everything. So you can use those cartoons, but, and I like those cartoons, but also that particular clip is about one where um, Bimbo, I think his name is, uh, Bibbo Bimbo, he joins a cult. And since Deprogrammed it was about, is a podcast about leaving a cult ideology, woke ideology, I thought it it kind of uh, was an Easter egg or, you know, something that people who who know that what the show's about would get. Okay. Put up the poll. I'll vote, says John. Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> Let's see. Here we go. Start a poll. Uh, do you like the music? That way, if you don't like it, you can say so anonymously and you don't have to worry. There we go. We'll see what, what people say. We want to do, we still have, we have all these things that we want to do. Um, now that his, his music studio room here, it, we've, we haven't finished that completely yet either. It's about halfway finished in terms of soundproofing and everything, but he intends to do a, a couple of, of special little songs for pop culture. When we bring pop culture back, hopefully in January, um, we want to have some special songs for when we play games, like, is there a tattoo of that or is that racist? <laughs> so if you have any musical suggestions, let me know. We also have a comedy, a, a ridiculous comedy album idea that we want to do um, just so all subscribers would get a copy of it automatically. But then we, yeah, for, for laughs, we would also put it up uh, where you put where anywhere you find music, <laughs> it's going to be terrible. Some of the songs are basically, these are songs that I sing to my husband just to make him laugh. Cause I'm, I'm not a good, I can't sing. Well, I just enjoy doing it. One of them is called good morning. It's tiger. And that song is pretty annoying. It sounds like a kid's TV show song. Uh, and there's a country song called, uh, cattle in the barn. <laughs> there's a few there's one uh there's one called um sunbathing in a burka anyway it's going to be some frivolous we're going to have it's it's going to be an intermittently a completely frivolous album instead of intermittent frivolity it's going to be all 100 percent frivolity just for fun and uh yeah so if you have other song ideas let me know okay John says, I may be a nerd, but Anthony Studio Tour and Finish would be awesome. I would love to do that. I'll show you guys that in video for sure. We also, if you live anywhere near the Georgetown, Texas area, we do concerts, like live concerts here in our home, even while we're still renovating. We've done three so far, three or four. And we're going to be doing the next one in March. I don't have the exact date yet, but um, we we put up a ticket link. Usually we don't put the ticket link up to the public because it's our home, but many, several people have come from deprogrammed audience. So you would just need to email me at deprogrammedpod at gmail.com and I'll give you the ticket link. Um, and every show is different. So the one in March, I know for sure is going to include his friend from Germany who's coming to visit, who's a brilliant musician. He plays like three or four instruments. And um, that's probably going to be sort of a old timey, old school country, Western kind of feel to that show. Um, we've also done a Latin music night. We've done, uh, we've had an opera singer. My husband's done classical piano. So that's, it's so, I just love these shows. Um, it's obviously it's something my husband does, but it feels like, you know, it's something we're doing together and people from my podcast come sometimes and everybody gets to have great conversation and you get to meet people. And so it's sort of like an old school salon style feel to the, to the shows. So, um, if you're anywhere near Georgetown, Texas, or if you're ever visiting, you are welcome to come unless you're a butthole. Don't come if you're a bad person <laughs> there, just putting that, putting that out there. Okay. <laughs> 
I've got a couple things to show you guys today. This, I'm going to start with the funny thing before I get into the big topic. I didn't get a chance to put the topic on the, on the thumbnail, but this is just, this cracked me up. I've been reading this guy, Theo Jordan, a lot on Twitter recently. He has a lot of great threads this year. And he shared this video. He said, the left is just gross at this point. Um, he says, note the masks. Of course, they would put dog poop under their nostrils if the moral told them tomorrow. Um, so I was looking at this video that he shared and see if you can figure out what these guys are doing. Here, I'll turn the volume up for you. So they're putting roses on packages of meat at the grocery store. And seriously, my first thought was, is, that, is this a free rose for a romantic steak dinner? So you buy a steak, you get a rose. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of sweet, actually. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Are these pita pe are these meat people? That are these uh are these like animal activists? Is that what's happening? What do you think's happening? Yeah, Andrew says. They got to be vegans. Well, if I were in that grocery store and I saw people doing this, I would walk right over and be like, thank you so much. I'm going to have a romantic steak dinner tonight with this rose. <laughs> I'm going to thank you for the rose. And just keep on going. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was funny. We'll stop sharing that. At some point, we have to do a whole episode on PETA and the animal rights activist movement because they have been infected by what I mean. I know a lot of you probably think they were already annoying and insufferable, but they have been infected by woke and they are speaking all the same language about oppressors and the oppressed, you know, the privileged and the marginalized. And we should do a whole thing about woke within the animal rights movement at some point. I think that would be interesting for some people, but okay. Let's, let's bring up my main topic today. This is a recent news article that I saw here in Texas. This is from the Dallas Weekly. A lot of times, if you have a weekly in your city, you know it's going to be leftist. Not that the mainstream media isn't as well, but the weekly is at least at least the mainstream papers. Well, I, I shouldn't say at least. I think it's kind of worse that they pretend to be non-biased. <laughs> I should go the other way. At least the weekly sort of explicitly lets you know that they're leftist. The the it's the daily papers and stuff that pretend to be non-biased. Um, okay. So this is from the Dallas weekly. You can imagine their, per, their point of view and their slant. But the reason why this is interesting to me is because again, I like to see the state of woke. I like to look at every once in a while, like the last episode of Curfewfee break, we watched a clip from the John Oliver show because I like to see where they're at, how far has it progressed in their vernacular in their lexicon? How many woke words do they use? A lot of the woke language back when I was in it, a lot of the words that have become now very mainstream, we hear this garbage all the time in popular culture and, in, in, you know, from comedians like John Oliver. And a lot of those things used to be uh, relegated exclusively to the academic world. I heard them in my classes, my women's studies classes, critical race theory classes, queer theory, but it had not yet seeped into the mainstream back then. So I was reading this article and it, wow, this, <laughs> this article is full of the academic bullshit jargon of woke. And I just wanted to pick through it. And I thought this could be another case study in deciphering a woke news article and sort of like what we did with the John Oliver piece and going through it slowly, just pointing out what it is they're doing here, what it is they're saying. What are they lying about? What are they obscuring? 
And so let's let's go through just a little bit. Somebody, can somebody help AH out? He says, I can't see poll questions. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe somebody in the chat can help you. I can see it on mine. Let's see. So far, we're at 91% of people like the song, the intro song, and 9% don't. Okay. I guess it's not, at least it's not everyone. Okay, let's go through this. How the education system fa fails. This is the title. How the education system fails black trans youth. This is, again, this is in a paper. So you expect it's going to have lots of evidence, right? About how the school system does it, right? You would think. Not in 2023. <laughs> this came out in November, November 21st. With Black, I'm going to make this larger. With Black trans youth more likely to experience anxiety, depression, or to seriously consider attempting suicide, the continued now first of all let's stop right there they don't show you any numbers which i would like to see numbers because if you're going to make claims like that you should show them however i'll tell you guys the last time i looked at these stats here's something interesting um black people are less likely to attempt suicide than white people um trans people yes are more likely to attempt people who say they're trans you know, are more likely to attempt suicide than people who don't say they're trans. That's true. Um, and the, the, the reason why that statistic is interesting is because one of the claims that woke people, social justice people like to make is that um, suicidal ideation or suicide attempts are, are themselves evidence of being an oppressed group. Are they 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 are themselves evidence of that the only reason that happens, the only reason you would see a higher, you know, suicide attempt rate in in one group over another has to be that that group is being oppressed in some way. They often make this claim in regards to trans people. They say, well, trans people, yeah, they have they have a higher suicide rate or suicide attempt rate, suicide attempt attempt rate, because they're an oppressed group, and it's because of all the bigotry that they face, and it's because of you know, and they don't ask any other questions. You're not allowed to try and say what else might be happening here. Why may it be that you see this in this group of people? Um, they always go straight to the ism. It's it's just like a. I remember we looked at a year or two ago, we looked at something, it was an article um, and it was something where Kamala Harris was talking about how the death rate during uh, birth for, for black mothers was higher than the death rate during birth for white mothers. And she said, this is a result of systemic racism. <laughs> you just like immediately to the ism. That's not science. I hope I, I shouldn't have to point that out. If there's anyone on the left watching, I think I do though. I'm and not to I'm not saying that to offend. I'm just saying it, it's a fact. I think I do need to point it out. I've been there. I've been in that part of the left. And sometimes these things need to be illuminated. Even to clever and smart people. That's not science. To start with your conclusion, oh, it must be racism or oh, it must be transphobia and work backwards. That's not science. So they do that a lot with the suicide rate for trans people. And one obvious thing that you can point to that proves that's not true. It, it proves it's not true that, that um, a higher suicide attempt rate is itself evidence of oppression is, is look at the suicide attempt rate for black people. If what they were saying were true, then they call, they continue to call black people, you know, oppressed and marginalized and in the social justice or woke stack of oppression, you know, black people are right up there at the top with trans people, but, and yet white people have a higher suicide attempt rate than black people do. So pretty obvious reason leads a person to believe, oh, I guess it's not being labeled a member of an oppressed group alone <laughs> that leads a person to higher 
suicide attempt rate. I know for some of you guys, you're like, duh, this is all duh. I know, but for people on the left, it's not. So that's why we're doing this sometimes. <laughs> so we'll continue. That was just a side note. Okay. With black trans youth more likely to experience anxiety, depression, or to seriously consider attempting suicide, the continued repression of trans rights in the school system is adding to its own school to prison pipeline. So they're starting here with the conclusion. They're starting with the conclusion that there is a continued repression of trans rights in the school system. Do these people ever enumerate what are the rights that you think you're not being given? And also, can you define rights? You should take it back, you know, to very basic questions with these people because they don't, a lot of times they don't understand what rights are. They call healthcare a right, for example. They call that a human right. A right is not something that a government gives you. For anyone who is new to this concept, maybe you're watching from, maybe you're someone on the left and you stumbled across this video or someone said, can you believe this crazy, hateful bigot? Look at what she's saying. <laughs> or I don't know. <laughs> it may be, I don't know how you got here. But you've probably never looked up the difference between what are called positive rights and negative rights. I know. I did not know anything about this or I wasn't interested in it even until I started getting out of woke. And I went to, you know, supposedly a great college. I went, I went to Duke University. I, was, I went to a specialized science and math high school that was very competitive, you know. I, I had a great education and... I did not know the difference between positive and negative rights. So I I can assume there are many people on the left who don't. In my experience, it's more often conservatives and definitely libertarians who know and, and who are interested in this kind of stuff. So a positive right, it's just it's like something that people give you. A a negative right is something that can't be taken from you, that you're endowed with. Our founders said you're endowed with these things, you know, by a creator. I believe, I believe it's by a creator. You might be atheist and say, well, I think humans are born with these things. And here's my reasoning. It doesn't involve a creator. Okay. But these are things you're like the, the right to pursue liberty, the right to life, the right to defend yourself. The founders spent a lot of time thinking about this when they wrote the, the Bill of Rights. It wasn't a list of things they were giving to people. It wasn't like, and you guys are going to get uh, somebody else. We're going to have somebody pay for your health care. Uh, and uh, you guys were going to have, uh, we're going to give you, um, you know, this goodie to make you happy. And over there, we're going to give you this. No, it was a list of the Bill of Rights was a list of things the government couldn't do to you, couldn't take away from you. Like they couldn't stop you from defending your from self-defense that's why the second amendment is so important they were trying to think of what are the most important things that we say these are things the government can't do that that th that that these are rights humans hold that no government should be able to take from them the right to free speech the right to property all of these things are you're endowed with these the government didn't give those to you These are things that lead to liberty and freedom, the right to property, being able to own things, being able to own the fruits of your labors. If you go out and work, you should be able to keep the fruits of your labors without somebody stealing it from you. Okay, so I know it's a little, you know, positive and negative rights for, for lefties. <laughs> a little little uh, for former carry. We'll do it that way. Okay. So I actually do start there. If I'm talking to someone on the left, I do start there. I ask them, well, what's a right? And I don't just start telling them this is what rights are. I let them try and define it because then they have to think about it. And they may have never thought about it before. And if they tell you something like a right is something the government gives you, or it's something, you, you, you know, you go from there, you go, but you listen 
to what they're saying and you go from there and you ask them more questions. And that's sometimes necessary for the, to, to even be able to have the conversation about what is a trans right that you're somehow not being given, you're being denied some kind of trans right. You, you actually really do in real life have to have the conversation about what is a right first. This person who wrote this for the Dallas Weekly, Brianna Pat, I haven't looked her up, but I mean, I don't, I am not assuming that she can define correctly what rights are <laughs> because she says stuff like this. The continued repression of trans rights in the school system. Sorry, how are, how are trans, so-called trans people, how are they being denied the right to um, life, liberty, property, self-defense? speech free speech how are, how are they being denied those things in the school system they're not okay continuing we're not going to read the whole thing because clearly i'm taking a lot of time on <laughs> on each part but it's just this is just chock full of woke um woke tenets of belief like like to, in order in order to read this and not ask these questions on every sentence, you have to have already accepted a lot of the woke brainwashing because if anybody who hasn't accepted the woke brainwashing, an actual, you know, critic, a person who thinks critically, or if there were such a thing as a neutral party or whatever, they're, they would read this and stop on every sentence. Like, what does that mean? The continued repression of trans rights. Is she going to explain that? I guess not. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take just a second because I saw Pirate Tomsky, you too kind, gave a super chat. 10 pounds. Uh, Pirate with the Christmas hat says, I've been popping in and out of chat recently because I'd been studying for an exam, which I passed on Friday. Congratulations. So back for a bit now, but I'm moving house. I knew that. I'm very excited for you. I'm moving house in the new year, so I'll be back to random then. Well, congratulations, Pirate Tomsky. And moving into a new house is a big deal. And I'm very excited for you. Okay. We'll continue. March 1st, 2022. The American Civil Liberties Union. Oh, great. <laughs> the other thing that you'll notice in, in the woke world is that they all reference each other. So you've got the completely corrupted organizations like the ACLU, the ACLU, which used to actually defend people's civil liberties. Now it ignores those. And, and like, for example, they will not defend the civil liberties of children who are used as guinea pigs in medical experiments, um, who, who are sterilized and mutilated by the system. They will not defend their civil liberties. Um, but that's, a, that's a whole nother video. This the ACLU has been completely corrupted with woke, though. They had an internal takeover. There was a coup leak document showed that this happened. This was several years ago now. And they they basically said at the time we're I mean, they said, but in different language, they were no longer going to defend civil liberties if uh, if it might harm uh, uh, one of the, uh, you know, an oppressed group. So they're putting woke above civil liberties in terms of priorities. So organizations like that, the woke media will always reference them. And it's just this continued circle, circle jerk where they're always, it's almost like self-referencing because they're all part of the same belief system. But here we go. March 1st, 2022, the ACLU announced that Texas Governor Greg Abbott directed Texas Child Protective Services to investigate the parents of children, specifically when those children appear to be receiving gender-affirming care. And they should investigate. Because what you're calling here gender-affirming care, what is that? Well, that's allowing the medical establishment to give off-label hormones and puberty blockers to children, to minors, Hormones and puberty blockers that often sterilize them. What else does gender affirming care mean? I mean it means double mastectomies for children. 
So yeah, those, those families should be investigated because that's child abuse. Children can, cannot consent. We as a society have, have all collectively said, we recognize that children are different developmentally than adults. And so we are going to protect them in our laws. We're going to reflect that acknowledgement in our laws. And we're going to make sure we protect them from themselves and from people who would do them harm. Therefore, we acknowledge in our laws, children cannot consent to sex or to smoking or to drinking or buying a gun or driving a car. And yet, currently, we're supposed to believe magically they can consent to being sterilized or having their breasts removed when they don't even know what sex is yet. So, good. The article continues. While this action ultimately led families, led to families relocating to a safer environment, there's a reversal. There's a complete reversal to a safer environment. You mean a safer environment for child abusers, not for children. Um, it was just one in a line of events that seek to ostracize and hyperfixate upon trans children. That hyperfixation extends into their day-to-day -day education, which can be detrimental. Disciplinary actions such as school zero tolerance policies, which can punish LGBTQ plus youth for violating dress code, or as Out for Mental Health also points out, result in unfair punitive action being doled out to them. Here's a quote. LGBTQ youth face unfair punitive action for violating sexuality and gender norms at school. This can include receiving punishment for violating gendered school dress code policies or engaging in adolescent behaviors for which they're non lgbt TQ peers are not disciplined. This year is has been happening now for 10 or 15 years. It's been increasing in the schools, in the public schools. I've talked to teachers from different states, or they've talked to me about this. Um, I've talked to a principal, one principal about this. There has been this overwhelming push from the top down for schools not to discipline any child who is in one of the social justice or woke religions oppressed groups or marginalized groups. There's been a real push not to treat them the same as other students, to treat them with the soft bigotry of low expectations, to treat them in a bigoted way, honestly, in a racist way, a sexist way, a homophobic way, a transphobic way, to treat them as if they are not fully human and capable of performing the same tasks and, and uh, demonstrating the same behavior as other students. This, is, this has been a push to basically say, if a student is repeatedly tardy but they're in one of these marginalized groups, like they're in the LGBTQ group or they're in the black group or don't mark them as tardy. If they have a fight and engage in physical violence, don't report them. This has been happening. This isn't some boogeyman. If you, if you don't believe this, ask teachers that you know if this is happening, if there is this pressure. Because what I've been told is happening is that the, at the end of the year, they're looking at data and you've got all these woke people now, these social justice people who are it, working in education, who are in the schools. And they look at the data and they say, wow, uh, for example, black students are being suspended at a much higher rate than white students. Well, that doesn't look good. That's what they say. And because they're in this ideology, as we already talked about, that jumps straight to a conclusion. It's a, it's a cult-like belief system. It gives them the conclusion without any questions, without any science search for truth happening. They say, well, if black students have a higher suspension rate, that must mean our school is systemically racist. Well, we have to stop suspending them then. 
or if it's, you know, LGBTQ students have a higher um, tard tardiness rate. We have to stop that. We have to stop reporting them as tardy. Same thing with grades, by the way. This is why you're seeing it's becoming more common for public schools to just say, we're going to do away with grades or we're going to give everyone the same grade or we're going to weight the grades. It's an outright war on meritocracy and it's a war on every one of these identity groups that they claim they're helping. You are not helping these people. You are hurting them. You're hurting these kids. You're setting them up for failure for the rest of their life. Those of us who oppose social justice and woke ideology, we need to start using the words. We need to start using the correct words. And I know some of us are, have already have been, but if you're not already, if you're not thinking of it in this way, this ideology, I've said from the beginning, the reason I left social justice, the reason I left woke is because I, it took me a long time, but I finally realized, wow, wait, this is racist. <laughs> this is really sexist. This is really telling us to judge and treat people differently based on what groups they're in. And it's racist towards every single group. It's racist towards white people in a different way than it is towards black people, but it's racist towards both. So this part of the article is basically, this is the new thing that's been going on for the past 10 or 15 years. It's They're just talking about it a lot out loud now, which is, you know, it's unfair. Look at this sentence. If an if if a youth faces punitive action at a school, they are assuming that the that the punitive action is unfair if they're LGBTQ. According to GLSEN, 51% of black trans youth during their K through 12 education, either out or perceived as trans, have experienced verbal abuse. 28% have been physically attacked and 19% have been sexually assaulted. 22% ultimately left sc school due to their mistreatment. In other instances, the bullying and the mistreatment of trans people can cause them to be pushed to a school to prison pipeline. <coughs> Here's the other thing. Excuse me one second. This ideology, social justice ideology, is all about collectivism instead of individualism. They don't believe the people who 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 get brainwashed into this, who get pulled into this, however you want to think of it, the people who are in it, who are true believers, who've, who've been in it, for a while, in it for a while, they don't believe in individual responsibility. So if a person's actions and behavior and choice to commit crimes <coughs> leads them to going to prison they don't view that as that person's fault if that person is in one of the so-called marginalized groups or oppressed groups. They view it as society's fault. It's sexism and racism and transphobia's fault. <clears throat> That's why they did those bad things. They don't believe in personal responsibility. Except when they do. They're hypocrites. <laughs> I should always have a caveat on every little thing. They have the way in which they treat people is entirely dependent on a person's race, sex, sexuality, whether or not they say they're trans, you know, all these different identity groups that people claim to belong to. So if they're if they're if you're talking about one of the somebody who belongs to one of the so-called oppressor or or privileged groups, then yes, they you're it, it's both. Then it's both. Like if I were to do um, I'm not a good example because I am in one marginalized group. I'm a woman. Let's take a, a straight white male. Let's take Pirate Tomsky. <laughs> if Pirate Tomsky were to commit a crime and go to prison, 
nothing about his childhood or the ways in which he was bull may have been bullied or may have been mistreated or bad things that may have happened to him. None of that matters to them because Pirate Tomsky is a straight white man. So he's in prison. It's both uh, because of what he did. He's personally responsible for it. And also because he, because of racism, sexism as, as society and a culture that led him to believe he could do these things and break rules and get away with it. <laughs> so they always contradict themselves. They don't have any universal principles. Everything is like, we believe this, except if you're in this group, then we believe that, right? Okay, we'll continue. As GLSEN states, Black trans youth are more likely to face disciplinary action. Um, and by the way, let me just tell you where they're getting this data. That, that's important to point out. Um, this is from a, a gay and lesbian uh, nonprofit. This is another woke nonprofit. Again, they can they always refer back to themselves, you know, uh, organizations that share their ideology. Um, I'm going to switch to this just for a second. If you go to this link and you're like, oh, I wonder where they got all this data. It's from a survey. I mean, I'm not saying that's not useful. I I read survey data too. I'm interested in it. But if you were reading this news piece, you would be thinking this is a lot more concrete than it is. Because this is from a survey that an ideologically slanted organization did with their members who share their ideology. So they're asking people who are in the same belief system as them that like, we're oppressed and, you know, we see victimization everywhere related to our special and unique identity, right? It was a survey of, I think, 2000 people. And you can go on there and you can read the answers, but that's where all this data came from survey just so you know. Okay. According to that GLSEN survey, 51% of black trans youth during their K through 12 education. Oh, we read that part. We, the school to prison pipeline. We read that. Okay. As GS, GLSEN states, black trans youth are more likely to face disciplinary action. 47% of Black LGBTQ youth faced disciplinary action compared to 36% of white European youth. We'll pause here for another second. The woke, people who are in my old belief system, social justice, woke, whatever you want to call it, once again, they look, when they, when they look at a data point like this, they have already been brainwashed with and fed the conclusion They've already been given the conclusion. They don't engage in science as much as they like to talk about science. They've appropriated that word, right? <laughs> they don't engage in asking questions. What could cause this? It's automatically the ism. It's automatically the result of racism sexism, homophobia, transphobia, fat phobia, all the phobias they've come up with, all the isms and phobias. You're just supposed to take it on faith. This is why a lot of us call it a religion of sorts, because so much of it is based on faith. In a paper by Meryl Green, titled LGBTQ Youth of Color in the School to Prison Pipeline, Freedom, Liberation, and Resistance. Resistance. She argues that evidence suggests that due to the unfair treatment, due to double marginalization, this is great. If you haven't heard this word before, uh, this, is a, this is a word that woke or social justice people use, this phrase. It means that you're in two, not one, but two of what they call the marginalized or oppressed groups. So they're talking about black trans students. So they're, they're a double, it's a double mark. It's like a double rainbow. It's a double marginalization. Twice the victim points. She argues that evidence suggests that due to the unfair treatment, due to double marginalization, marginalization of trans youth, 
They are more likely to utilize violence. Now, pay attention to this part. They are more likely to utilize violence to defend themselves against the bullying they endure, which can lead to something Vanessa Panfo calls a gang double bind. Okay, so I looked at this this paper that they're referencing here by Meryl Green, and you're about to see someone legit argue that a person who decides to engage in violence first, they are the initial aggressor. If, again, everything's dependent on the identity groups, right? If that person who decides to be the aggressor and engage in violence, if they are in the black group and the trans group, they are not responsible for that violence because they're trying to preemptively defend themselves against future violence that hasn't happened to them yet. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> that's what that's what this paper argues. Here, I'll show you. That's, now, this writing is very tiny because this is a study. Um, I'm trying to make this one larger. Ah, no, it pushed me all the way to the top of the paper. Okay, I'm just going to read this to you. And then I'm sorry you can't. I'm sorry you can't read along, but let me read this part to you. <clears throat> okay. Panfil. Panfil's another person, another woke person who did an academic paper. Wow. Panfil found that in school victimization was strongly correlated with delinquent behavior, gang membership, and engagement in violence, and that LGBTQ youth were decidedly more likely to have been in a gang at some point in their academic career. So what we're learning here is that apparently, according they're saying that LGBTQ youth are youth of color. So they have to be in these, these two groups, double marginalization, right? That they're more likely to be in a gang. But that's not their fault, right? That's the fault of racism and transphobia. No personal responsibility for these guys. Both studies found that LGBTQ youth of color often turn to gang membership in order, oh, oh, but it's in order to protect themselves from violent victimization in school. And they sought out a support system of peers in, in lieu of institutional support from school administrators. Moreover, Panfield discusses the phenomenon of the gang double bind, wherein, here we go, LGBTQ youth of color engage in violence in order to prevent their own victimization in the future. <laughs> and in doing so, their involvement in such violence only increases their vulnerability to additional violence, both through gain activity and at the hands of the juvenile justice system. Because according to this paper, the juvenile justice system, that's more violence against them. All they did was commit a little violence to prevent future violence against themselves. And somehow they got put in prison, which is another form of violence against them. And, you know, what, what is a person supposed to do to protect themselves from future violence, if not commit violence themselves? <laughs> right? That's how stupid this is. <laughs> Pre-crimes is Dion. Yes. Yes, they are convicting all of society with pre-crime. They are convicting the school system with pre-crime. They're saying, oh, but these LGBTQ plus A1894, I don't know, that, that these, you know, queer and of color students, they have to do violence to protect themselves from future violence. Don't you guys understand? If you put them in prison, that's you're just doing more violence to them. <laughs> I just I have to laugh at it. You have to laugh at it because it's ridiculous. I know I mention it a lot, but I really love that Thomas Sowell quote about how some ideas are so stupid, only an intellectual could believe them. <laughs> and it's true. And if you are a person who maybe you didn't go to college, maybe you, you weren't familiar with all these ridiculous words until they hit the mainstream a few years ago. Uh, if you have ever been made to feel you're just not smart enough to get it, 
You're not smart enough to get this is an academic paper. You didn't go to college. You're not just smart enough to get it. Don't ever, ever buy that bullshit. That's like people at a modern art museum telling you you're not smart enough to understand why the poop smeared on the wall is art. <laughs> like, do you just know? <laughs> people who are actually intelligent, in my experience, they go out of their way to make themselves understood or to be clear. They don't need to obfuscate what they're saying, to hide what they're saying. They don't need to do that. In order, that's what that's what mid IQ people do to make themselves feel smart. That's that. Oh, what's that three word guy's name? The guy that had the debate with Jordan Peterson, the black eye, and Michael Eric Dyson is a great example of that. That's his name. Michael Eric Dyson tries to use a lot of big words and he doesn't also clearly define them so that he, and if, especially if he uses a bunch of them together, he's hoping you will hear that and go, wow, I guess I just don't get it. You know, <laughs> no, <laughs> my pastor has a very big vocabulary. He always defines his words. If he says something like, uh, okay, if, if we attempt to anthropomorphize God, and then he'll follow it up with, you know, assign human characteristics to God. It just comes naturally to explain that. And it's wonderful because you might learn some new words, but from listening to him, he's not using big words to make you feel stupid. He's using bigger words to make you feel included. So all this to say, if you're reading a piece of academic crap like this that's trying to sound smart um don't let don't let someone talk down to you and tell you you know that that this is that that this is not a pig just because it's wearing lipstick okay you know it's a pig <laughs> let me see pirate tonsky if you want to enrage a leftist make them define words drives them crazy. I do. I often ask them to define something like at the very beginning when I ask, you know, do you know how to, how would you define rights? And you have to, if you want to have a real conversation with them, I would advise don't say it in a way with contempt for them. Like, I bet you can't even define rights. Don't say it like that. Unless, unless the conversation's already gone that way and, you know, it's not worth it. But if they're really coming at you with good faith or good ish faith, <laughs> I just say like, oh, well, so when you say rights, what do you mean? And you could even say something like when you when you start to talk about the difference between negative and positive rights with them, a lot of times you um, you can soften something that is a um, the op opposite of what they're saying. I'm going to stop sharing this. You can. What's the word? In a conversation, one of the hardest things and you guys will know this just from personal relationships, is if you're trying to say something and you don't want the other person to feel defensive, uh, but they do. And oftentimes a person uh, becomes defensive. It's human nature to become defensive if you feel you are being challenged or someone made you look stupid. And, and so if you're sharing new information with someone, one way you can do that is, and this is the way I often do it, is you could just say, oh, hey, you know, I just learned something. I just learned about the difference between positive and negative rights. Have you heard about that? Like, that's the way I'll say it. Because if you say it that way, it's not a, it's not like you idiot. <laughs> you don't, you don't know what rights are. It's you're including yourself in, hey, I just learned this thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully it does. There's a way to talk to people in which you're not, um, you're less likely to put them on a defensive foot. Now, some people are just primed. They're looking for offense everywhere and they'll still feel offended that, you know, you introduce something new to them. But a lot of people won't. Their barriers will come down. And that's how I have, that's how you have like the best conversations with someone who disagrees with you is by not coming at them with condescension or a kind of an arrogance about, you know, I'm teaching you something new. What are you guys talking about in the chat? 
<laughs> Adam Worrell says, today's Sesame Street was brought to you by Bonus Hole. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's continue. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that study because this this news article, this recent news article in the in the Dallas Weekly is referring to that paper and that paper, as we saw, and you can read more of it. I'll put the link below. But um, that paper basically says that if a student commits violence, well, no, what they said, what that paper said was that that queer students of color, so students who are in these two woke marginalized groups, right, that they will often commit violence in order to prevent future violence. And so I, I guess they're supposed to be excused for that. And then, and then if they face any punishment for it, that's an extra violence done to them, you know? So, so again, they don't believe in personal responsibility. We'll continue. Oh, here's the quote we looked at. I guess I could have just read it here instead of going to the study. LGBTQ youth of color engage in violence in order to prevent their own victimization in the future. <laughs> and in doing so, their involvement in such violence only increases their vulnerability to additional violence, both through gang activity and at the hands of the juvenile justice system. In this context, LGBTQ students of color are placed at a significant disadvantage in schools as they are often victimized and then subsequently punitively disciplined for fighting back against their abusers. Wait a minute. I thought you just said they committed the violence first, um, but it's wrong for them to be disciplined because they're just fighting back. What are they fighting back against? Future violence. <laughs> what? <laughs> You mean something that hasn't happened yet and may not happen? Yeah. <laughs> what? Okay. Putting it into the pipeline. Here we go. Now, again, they've never proved, they've never proved in this article or in the studies they refer to that there's some kind of pipeline that the schools are, the schools themselves are racist and transphobic and they're the ones that are, they're the, they're at fault for these students going to prison later for committing a crime. They've never shown that to be the case, but we're supposed to believe that's the case, okay? It's this terrible pipeline. Okay, so with the increased likelihood that Black trans children will be more subjected to the school-to-prison pipeline, what can be done to counteract this dangerous path? Well, <laughs> I don't think... Until you know what the problems are, I don't think you can give solutions. And they are assuming that the problems, they're just assuming that the problems are racism and transphobia. So I think their solutions are going to be quite different from what my proposed solutions would be or yours. But we'll see. Green suggests utilizing different pedagogies or learning methods. Oh, wow. I'm glad they defined it. <laughs> <laughs> like I just gave, like I just told you, that's actually good. They didn't pretend like, uh, they didn't just use it and not define it for you. Okay. Learning methods, specifically changing what we perceive as a criminal in our heads. Oh, so they're saying the answer to crime, the answer, because there are more black trans people committing crime than in other groups, I guess. There's a higher percentage they're saying of black trans people who end up in prison and committing crime, that the answer is that we have to change what we perceive as criminal in our heads. Oh, so if we don't view murder to be murder, if it's done by a black trans person, then they're not a criminal anymore. <laughs> If we don't punish black trans people for crime or hold them accountable for it, then they won't be criminals anymore. That's what they mean. I know I'm kind of making this funny, but that is exactly what they mean. And as I said at the beginning of this article, that's what they've been doing in schools for 10 or 15 years. They've been saying, if they're tardy, if they're absent, if they engage in violence in the school, don't write it up. And then it won't exist. And that's what they're saying to do with the law. They're taking it beyond school now. Now they're saying we have to change. Society has to change what's criminal. 
Now, do you think they mean to change what's criminal for everyone? Like, let's just make murder legal or theft? No. They want to make it identity dependent. Because again, their ideology is identity dependent. So they want to change what is criminal, but only, only for people who are in this racial group or or this uh, group based on sex or this group based on sexuality or whether or not they say they're trans. That's it's it's not across the board. That's what's that's the one part that's not being said here. Hold on, I'm just checking to see. <laughs> Ken Jack Ben, I just wanted to see what you guys thought because I thought this is crazy. It's only a crime because it's a legal man. <laughs> Right, that's what they're saying. <laughs> Let's just not call it a crime if if they check off the right boxes. Um oh hey, wow, there's a lot of folks in the chat today. Good to see you guys. Hey Cheeky Mare, get up for Cheeky Mare, one of our mods. She says, if they're looking for a fence, I will show them my chain link fence. I I don't know what that's regarding, but hello, Cheeky Mare. <laughs> Good to see you. Dion, so I can murder any man because any man I want by merely saying that it was preemptive because I'm sure he was going to rape me. Pretty much. That seems to be what they're arguing. Although, as you probably already know, Dion on their uh their priv what's called the privilege stack or the the it's it's like the stock market, how the number prices go up and down. <laughs> they have a whole they have a whole woke or social justice stack, and sometimes things move up and down on it. And women, we've been moved pretty far down that list. They still call us marginalized. They still call us oppressed. But man, there's a lot of other groups ahead of us. Um, and you know, if you take any of those groups and line them up, us next to each other, they're like, ah, oh, we're way down here. We lose. <laughs> It was a pun, says Cheeky Mare. Ah, oh, I love puns. Oh, a fence. I get it. If they want a fence, a fence. She says, I'll give them a fence. Uh, my chain link fence. That's funny. Sorry, I ruined the joke. I did. Okay. Here, we'll, we'll continue with some of this craziness because we don't, again, we don't have to read the whole thing, but. Man, this is in Dallas, too, guys. This is in Texas. We'll continue with the insanity. Quote, to educationally address the factors driving the criminalization of LGBTQ youth of color. Now, I'm going to pause right here. This is something they do a lot if you haven't seen this before. It's a sleight of hand. They like to say... And again, without any evidence or proving this in, in what they're writing, there's no argumentation here. They are trying to say that we, society, we and the school system and the justice system and, you know, our society's sexism and racism and homophobia, we have criminalized being an LGBTQ youth of color. That's a lie. They speak like this as if this is truth and as if we've already accepted this premise, right? This isn't a, a quote about like, let me explain to you what I mean by the criminalization of LGBTQ youth of color. No, they're just saying it like we've all accepted that we do this. We've criminalized. It's somehow criminal to be LGBTQ youth of color, except it's not. Nobody is being taken to prison. What's your crime? What's my crime? Well, sir, you're, I uh, hate, hate to break it to you, but you're an LGBT youth of color and that's illegal around these parts. No. <laughs> no one's being taken to prison for being an LGBTQ youth of color. What this little sleight of hand language thing does, they are masters of manipulation. Like any cult leader, like any con artist, like any grifter, like any uh, snake oil salesman, they are masters of manipulation. And what this little sleight of hand and language does is it hides the crimes. They are pretending 
that if an LGBTQ youth of color goes to prison, that it's that what they're guilty of is being an LGBTQ youth of color. Where are the crimes here? They're not going to, we're not supposed to look at that. Again, no personal responsibility if you're in a marginalized group. Oh, and if you're double marginalized, whoa, you know, you're not guilty of anything you've done. I'll continue to educationally address the factors driving the criminalization of LGBTQ youth of color is to change the cultural dialogue around the ways in which we construct the criminal in our heads. <laughs> really, this is what they're arguing. We need to change the way we can think about and define criminal. Moreover, given that neoliberalism sustains itself Upon the ideals of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy, <laughs> we'll pause right there too. We'll pause right there too. I know you guys are probably know what I'm going to say, but this is more social justice, woke, gobbledygook. The, this is another huge premise that we're supposed to have already accepted. They're not going to attempt to define this or explain it because they feel like they don't have to. We're supposed to take this on faith. We're supposed to take it on faith that neoliberalism sustains itself upon the ideals of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. Never mind, like, what are those things? What are their ideals? Can you prove that exists currently in this society and that it sustains neoliberalism. There's a lot of things we're already supposed to have accepted. And if you're in the brainwashed cult, you have. When I was woke and I read a sentence like this, I would have just been nodding like, mm-hmm. Yeah. I already accepted all the premise, uh, every single premise in that sentence fragment. They had already, all the work had already been done. All the brainwashing had already been done. So it's like, I'd read this back then, and I I didn't ask the questions you're supposed to ask that a normal person would ask. Like, wait, wait, all of a sudden you just put a, it's like saying, you know, moreover, given that the moon is made of cheese, you know, like, it's, just, it's, like, it's like saying something and they just continue. Wait, wait, is the moon made of cheese? <laughs> <laughs> did you did you prove are we all just agreeing the me oh okay i guess we're all just so do you think the moon's made of cheese don't ask that <laughs> like but that's what it's like okay moreover given that neoliberalism sustains itself upon the ideals of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy a counter movement in education that is critically analytical of race class, gender, and sexuality is long overdue, Green says. Now, again, uh, I'll just point out one thing here just very quickly. Criti critically analytical, this is um, reversal again. They use reversal a lot. The, in this case, they're pretending to uh, possess a trait that they don't have. They're pretending that they, they like, they like the phrase critical, critically, critical analysis, critical thinking, just like they like science, the word science. These are things that they, they still place value in as good. These are good things. These are things that they like to pretend that they possess or that they encourage. So if you think of it, you think of this ideology, like a, it is in some ways I've talked about before I've interviewed um, Josh Slocum about this in some ways, social justice and woke, it functions like, like a cluster B personality disorder. And it helps. You can find it helpful sometimes to think of uh, an individual with one of those personality disorders. And you will see those individuals a lot of times, especially the ones who have NPD who are narcissists, you will see them in, um, one of the things they do is it, they they collect traits. They they try to make you think they possess traits that they still place value in or they know you place value in. So 
they will try and present a mask of in the, in this example of being being an ideology that's all about critical thinking and it's, it's very analytical they project it they have to tell you that they are those things by the way just like an individual narcissist an individual narcissist is the kind of person who goes on twitter and is like i am the best and the smartest and the you know they have to tell you all the things they are because nobody else says that about them. <laughs> it's true though. <laughs> that, that they have they'll they're constantly projecting like on a wall. They have a, a projector and they're telling you like these are all the things I am. Just remember I help lots of people. I am very smart and giving and I am very and that's what this ideology does and that's why they use their if at some point they stopped valuing science, they would quit using it. But they currently, they still place value in that for some reason. However, they are not. They are not the side of science. They don't believe in science. They don't even practice science. Science is about asking questions. It's not about starting with a conclusion and working backwards. Woke, social justice, starts with the conclusion and works backwards. That's a faith. That's a belief system. But they like to project that they're about science. They like to project that they are critical, that they think critically, they ask critical questions, they're analytical. They don't do any of those things. It's a little bit of a rant on that phrase, but just wanted to point that out. And you'll see it right here. Um, with anti-critical race theory, and they call it critical race theory, <laughs> with anti-critical race theory and anti-LGBTQ bills surrounding schools being written and passed in Texas, it may be a bit difficult. But parents of trans children, when they are able to, cracking down on the discrimination trans people endure. Uh, is it me or is that sentence missing a word? but parents of trans children when they are able to cracking down that that's a terror. How did that sentence make it in here? That's okay. Whatever. <laughs> it's missing a word or two. For instance, in Sherman, Texas reversed a decision to remove a trans teen from a musical production of Oklahoma after their decision was condemned by num numerous speakers. And in, in 2022, the ACLU also created the student rights hub, which currently serves as a place for parents, teachers, and kids alike to learn what is happening in Texas schools and inform them about student rights. Quote, to, to thrive in our diverse state, students must be taught an accurate history of our country. This, again, what did we just talk about? This is projection. They do not want students to be taught an accurate history of our country. They don't. They absolutely don't. They want our students, they want students to be brainwashed with an ideological view, an incorrect ideological view, that our country is founded, that our founding principles are white supremacy, heteropatriarchy. What are the other ridiculous buzzwords they used in this piece? Cis normativity, they didn't use that, but they that's one of them. They do not want our students to be taught an accurate history of our country, but they'll project this, right? reversals to thrive in our diverse state students must be taught an accurate history of our country and learn about the experiences of many different communities our new students rights hub will provide resources to support students ability to learn and access a range of ideas free from discrimination the site also tracks dress code censorship and a list of ways for texas parents and students alike to advocate to learn more about trans student rights a phrase we never defined in this entire article, click here. <laughs> there we go. That's the end. So, yeah, I thought this was a pretty amazing piece. Interesting. I'm joking. Uh, it was amazing, though, for being able to point out, use it as an example to point out how woke ideology, how far it has infiltrated media and the different types of language games they play. 
if you think there's someone on the left who would appreciate this video and you're not afraid to send it to them, please do so afterwards. Okay, we're going to stop sharing that. There's something else I wanted to show you guys that's somewhat related, maybe only in my weird mind, but <laughs> in that piece from the Dallas Weekly, when they're talking about how terrible it is for, oh, it's so terrible in Texas. It's so terrible for these double marginalized people. <laughs> it's so terrible. Well, I saw something on Twitter yesterday. Was it yesterday or today? That was pretty exciting. Oh, it's today. Here we go. I'll put this up. One of these woke social justice LGBTQ to a plus infinity groups. One of them, uh, this one in Florida, just issued this statement. I thought this was amazing. Okay. This is from Equality Florida. And this is a state group, but they have, it's a national group and they have, I guess you would call them state chapters. So there's an Equality Texas too. But Equality Florida, which is a woke social justice group that is under the, um, they claim to be under the um, LGBTQ plus umbrella. So here we go. LGBTQ civil rights group, Equality Florida, has issued a travel advisory warning of the quote risks the risks posed to the health, safety, and freedom of those considering short or long-term travel or relocation to the state of Florida. It's a huge travel warning. Look, they put it in big font too. So you, you know it's serious. Equality Florida issues advisory warning for travel. <laughs> advisory. Now, it's, it's not about, this is not about any kind of, this is not a weather related advisory. It's about the storms of bigotry in Florida. St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, Equality, Flor Equality Florida took the extraordinary step of issuing a travel advisory warning of the risk posed to the health, the safety, and the freedom, the freedom of those considering short or long-term travel or relocation to the state of Florida. The move comes in response to a wave a tidal wave, you might say, a hurricane of, of safety inquiries that Equality Florida has received following the passage of laws that are hostile to the LGBTQ community, restrict access to reproductive health care, repeal gun safety laws, foment racial prejudice, and attack public education by banning books and censoring curriculum. One of those books that's so-called banned. By the way, none of these books are banned. That's another thing. That's a language game right there. Ask them. Ask them. Can you not? You really can't buy that book in Florida? Because I'll buy it for you. I, I'll get you one here. Oh, oh, you can buy it. Oh, oh, you just go on Amazon. Oh, or any bookstore. Or even the public library. Oh, you can get it at the public library. I thought it was banned. Oh, you just mean you took it out of public school libraries. Okay. And what's in that book? The book Gender Queer, for example. Oh, it's cartoon images aimed at kids of children giving blowjobs and sucking each other off. And why was that in the school library in the first place? I have a question for those people who use words incorrectly like this. None of those books that they say have been banned have been banned in Florida that you get, they can still get them anywhere. A kid cannot get them in a school library, just like they can't get Playboy or Penthouse in a school library. Would you consider Penthouse has been banned? Has it been banned in Florida? No. We'll continue though. So this travel Quality Florida issues advisory warning for travel. This guy who shared this, by the way, he's dead serious. This is serious stuff. He wants people to be warned. It is with great sadness. Here's a quote from the, the press release. It is with great sadness that we must respond to those asking if it is safe 
to travel to Florida or remain in the state at all as the laws strip away basic rights and freedoms, said Nadine Smith, Equality Florida Executive Director. What basic rights? Again, what are rights? Can you define them? Because you use that word an awful lot, saying people are being, they're being taken away. What rights? The Florida Immigrant Coalition, made up of more than 65 organizations, has also issued an advisory, another travel advisory. Oh. <laughs> Quote, travel to all areas of Florida should be done with extreme caution as it can be unsafe for people of color. Individuals who speak with an accent in Florida, really? <laughs> and international travelers. What? So... These people don't live in reality. However, I don't think we should tell them that. Um, I want them to think this about Texas. So I went to Equality Texas. I went to their Twitter and I was looking. I could not find. Equality Texas has not issued an advisory warning for travel to Texas. And I think they should. I would like for them to do one of these for Texas. I would help them get the word out and just, you know, let people know not to relocate here it is not safe <laughs> and so if you are in texas consider joining me i know it's weird that i'm asking you to like uh, you know come together to support equality florida and equality texas but i think this is something that we have some common ground on and we share we may not share reasons um but we have similar goals I would also like to prevent woke people from considering short or long-term travel or relocation to my state. And I think this is a win-win. So um, if somebody is watching from Equality Texas, what? why are you so slow? Florida has already put this out. And they've also got, it's not just Equality Florida. They've got a travel warning from another group, Florida Immigrant Coalition. What get on the ball, social justice people in Texas? What are you doing? We need a travel warning. Thank you. That's that's my <laughs> that's my piece on that. <laughs> Frankly, I'm shocked I couldn't find one. <laughs> okay. I think that's enough of the serious topics for today. Oh, no, that was kind of funny. That last one's kind of funny. It was serious. But uh, let's see. What else was I, was I going to say? Oh, well, a couple of people. This is a this is a thing about God. So if you're somebody who's in the audience who's an atheist and you don't want to hear this part, no no offense taken if you leave now um oh but by the way pirate tomsky says don't come to texas we won't trans your kids yeah we need to i'm just saying it could it might help us to get on the same page with some of the leftists who are trying to warn people not to come here <laughs> like like yes we'll help let's take out a billboard we could split it 50 50 don't come don't move to texas we'll put it right on the border it's not safe here. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So this last thing, Joseph Massey. Hello, sir. Joseph Massey, the poet is here. Um, brilliant poet and really cool human. If you guys are not following him on Twitter, you should be. So yeah, this was just kind of a stream of consciousness thing about some stuff I was reading the past couple of days. James Lindsay did an excellent thread about Christianity being an antidote to woke. And it's kind of phenomenal, especially coming from an atheist like himself. And it's coming from more of that, uh, I don't know what you call it, maybe a pr pragmatic view of here are some of the things about Christianity that can help and are it could help as an antidote to woke that are the opposite of woke tenets of belief. Right. And I thought it was a great thread. And uh, I know there were some people supposedly Christians bashing on him for it, which I don't get. It's like, I love it when 
someone, especially when someone uh, who has different beliefs than I do, but we have, have some common ground on something or I, I don't know. I just have, I have a lot of respect for atheists who are like, Oh, I respect this about your faith, even though I'm not in that faith. And and I respect some of the things that they say, even though I'm not an atheist, do you know what I mean? Like we have, we're not completely opposed to one another all the time. So um, some people were given in flack for it, which I thought was dumb. So anyway, I took it a step further and I said, I think it's the, I think God is the antidote to woke. And not just woke, all evils. I do. I didn't know that would be so controversial or... I mean, because of course I believe that. That's why I came to faith. Like that's... <laughs> or And that's what's worked for me in every step on this path. I guess this walk with God. The Christians call it a walk with God. Every single time there's been something i've needed help with god has been the, the antidote to it and this is, people were saying all kinds of different things one of the things i thought was interesting was a couple different people tried to do the uh, oh no scotsman fallacy when they get brought up the example of woke christianity they said well what about woke christianity is woke christianity you know something similar to that but woke christians people who claim to be christians but who preach woke they exist so therefore that's not an antidote to woke right and i was like that is so weird um because you're pointing to something that's not christianity no matter what it calls itself it's actually the antithesis to christianity you're pointing to that and telling me okay so christ so god's not the antidote because of this thing over here that's not god and that's when the, a few of them were like, and I knew they were going to say this, oh, no, Scotsman fallacy. The thing about the fallacies, I think a lot of people who first get into reading about them, which I did a, a few years ago, is um, they don't realize that sometimes those things are actually true. Slippery slope is another one that's actually, it, sometimes it's accurate. <laughs> and the problem with those is when you're putting, you're using them alone as a reason uh, for why you're saying an argument is wrong. Um, so they were saying, oh, what you're doing, basically, if you don't understand what I'm saying, or maybe you don't know what the fallacies are, there's, they're saying that uh, because I said woke Christians are not Christians, they're not true Christians, they're not Christians, woke, woke Christians are not Christians, that I'm engaging in the no true Scotsman fallacy. No true Scotsman would, uh, I don't know, what, what would, no true Scotsman would, drink almond milk i don't <laughs> and so um but here's here's where they're wrong and this one they are absolutely wrong they're engaging in postmodernism. they're pretending like there is no absolute truth like words don't mean anything i'm gonna say something else that they'll find hard to wrestle with maybe no true man is a woman that's true no true cat is a dog. That's true. No woke Christian is a Christian. That's true. How do you know these things? It's not just because I said that. It's not just because I said no true Scotsman drinks almond milk. It's because there's evidence of it. Christianity means something. It doesn't mean just whatever you say it means. It's based on the word of God. It's based on the Bible and the gospel. If a church, a woke church, is out there preaching sexual immorality is cool, with polyamory and, um, you know, adultery is awesome. And uh, if they're out there preaching uh, woke, if they're out there preaching woke, which is preaching that uh, people should be judged on the basis of what race they're in and what sex they're, they are and uh, that they should be treated differently on the basis of a coll what collective they're in instead of as individuals. That's the actual opposite. That's the opposite of the gospel. I don't care if they call it Christianity. I know a lot of wokes. There's a section of woke that likes to identify as Christianity the same way some men like to identify as women. That doesn't make it Christianity. Duh. Words mean things. 
when Jesus says in the Bible, okay, when, when it's like, do not lie. Those are only three words. They all mean something. We're not postmodernists here. <laughs> if you are preaching the opposite of that, you're not preaching Christianity. You're not. I don't care if you call it that. I hope that makes sense. Yes, exactly. Elsa Barrett. Progressivism is Christian ideology inverted. It is. Woke ideology is an upside down cross. Woke ideology is putting yourself at the top. Not God. Okay. I don't know. There were some more thoughts I had about that. It was pretty interesting. But then I was thinking, wow, people need to learn more about the fallacies because I think maybe if they're at like the stage where you're learning about them and then you think, if I ever hear that being said, that means that's a falsehood. It's not. Viking. I love this question. Maybe we, <laughs> maybe I should eventually change the name of the live shows. Viking says, in the English language, what does kerfeffy mean? Well, hello, Viking. It doesn't mean anything. It's a nonsense word. It's, it's kind of a joke. The, the, there was a time when Trump, our, our president, he said something or the media said he said something that wasn't a real word. He said kerfeffy. And they spelled it K-O-V-F-E-F-E. -F -F -E. And I just thought that was so funny. And uh, on an, a different podcast I used to do, we we were trying to come up with a name and I thought it'd be funny. I always wanted to do a show called Coffee Break. I mean, who doesn't? That's really simple. You want to have coffee. But everybody has a coffee break name. It's like Kefefe Break is pretty funny. It's close to coffee. It was spelled very, it was very similar. And then when I started to program, some of the knitters in the audience said, oh, you should keep, you should just change the Kefefe for Carrie change it to K-E-R. So it's just a long, ridiculous explanation. And I'm sorry about that. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it is just, it's just a silly frivol frivolity word. I think it was you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said the knitters, but I consider you a knitter. You're uh, knitting adjacent. Pirate Tomsky. He said, I coined Kerfefe. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up soon. I, if you guys have any questions before I go, feel free to drop them in the chat. We could do a short short uh, Q&A before I go. My husband and our friend are downstairs working on the ceiling right now. And so this is another one of those examples where I'm like, oh, I don't want to finish the stream because then I got to go mud the ceiling, uh, the wall. We have to, I have to touch up the walls actually before we paint. Um. Oh, Crush Mondo. Hey, dude. Good to see you. I think it's been a while since I've seen you. Thank you for the super chat. He says, the fact that progressives try to replace Christianity with their own version says something about Christianity. They wouldn't do that with Islam or any Eastern religion. Let me think about that for a second. I think that's true for the most part. But recently, I don't know, I'd have to think about it more because have you noticed, Crash Mondo, that there seem to be an awful lot of so-called queer wokies, the LGBTQ plus a tribe who are woke, who are suddenly saying that they stand with Hamas and they're suddenly defending, very interested in Islam. And this is a very new phenomenon. If you haven't seen this, and there's a ton of young people, these young woke people creating videos on TikTok saying that they're studying Islam now. And they love it because it's not, um, what did they call it? One of the ones I saw was talking about how she loved it because it wasn't um, sexist and patriarchal like Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> it's not homophobic like Christianity, she said. Uh, I think she's going to keep reading. she got to keep reading just a little bit. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the super chat. John, is your helpful friend also a lawyer? I remember an interview a while back. 
No, this is a friend of ours who he's a, a longtime friend of my husband's from the music world, but he's also a contractor. And so he does great work and gives us great advice on, we've learned a lot of things from him and through YouTube, but sheet rocking, uh, floating, that's where we put the tape down, the mudding, sanding, all of that. He's helped us with all of that. And he's cut doorways for us. Um, you know, anything that we don't need an actual plumber or electrician for, uh, we try to either either he helps us with it or he does it sometimes or he shows us how to do it. So that's been really great. Is he also a massage therapist? What, what are these questions are weird? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, is that supposed to be funny? Because it is. <laughs> uh. Viking says, because you do not want to know the Finnish word very close to kerfefe. Well, now I must know. Are you not going to tell me? I mean, you can't say something like that and then not tell a person because that's all they're going to want to know. What is the Finnish word very close to kerfefe? If somebody can drop it in the chat, that'd be great because now I need to know. I wonder if I named my show something dirty without realizing it. I'll tell you guys a, a quick story. When I was so I when I was in college, I took um, Swahili for four years, and I did so because I knew. Well, I was a biological anthropology and anatomy major, and a primatology. I had a primatology certificate in the end, but I knew I wanted to go to East Africa um, to study primates. And my senior year, I did, and um, and the Swahili was great preparation for being there. Um, and anyway, it, so here's the, here's the funny part. This is a little dirty. There was one guy I hung out with a lot there. He helped me with my research project. I hired him to go with me to the forest every day. He was awesome. He was so smart and funny. His, his name was Onesmo. And, um, I mean, he did things like he killed a black mamba for me. That's one thing he did, which is one of the most poisonous snakes in the world, uh, with his machete. But we would hang out. His English was great. And he was a little nervous about his English, I guess you could say. Or he was asking me, you know, if I ever got to go to America, do you think people could understand me? Do you think my English is good enough? And I was like, Onesmo, um, you have a vocabulary bigger than most Americans. You have an English vocabulary bigger than most Americans. And uh, I'm trying to think of an example. There, there was a word he had just used. Um, nepotism. He had just used the word nepotism the day before. I'm like, you know, I mean, you, you know, you know, words like nepotism, you'll be fine. But he wanted to learn. He wanted to get better at his English slang, his American slang. And so he, I was teaching him when we were in the forest every day, I was doing a, a, a it was a behavioral research study. So it had to do with uh, different layers of the canopy and uh, called us monkeys and how often they use different levels in this forest that was being deforested. So there was a lot of downtime where you're sitting there in the same place and waiting for different monkey troops to come by to have something to observe. So a lot of times you're just plotting nothing. So I was teaching him all this slang. It was so funny. I taught him American jokes. I was like, we'd be walking through the forest and like, Onesmo, you drop something, hold on, I'd pick it up. And then I would do the middle finger, you know, like that was, I was young and this is young people did silly jokes like this or like shake hands and then go. Ah. <laughs> and so he was learning all this and, um, and I was taking, teaching him slang words. And then one day he finally asked me, he said, what does Fila mean? F I L A. And I've, because they they resell a lot of American thing goods there, like and a lot of things that get given to Goodwill and charity charities will make their way there. So you'll see people wearing shirts they do, they don't know what they say. Like you'll see guys wearing shirts that say zero to bitch in sixty seconds. You know, like a woman's shirt <laughs> and things like that. But in a lot of the marketplaces, people the Fila brand, which is just an athletic brand like Nike or something, Fila, 
It was very popular there. And you would even see they made little uh, rings out of aluminum that would say Fila. And the young people really would wear this. It was kind of everywhere. They would make their own Fila stuff. And he was like, what does Fila mean? I said, nothing. I don't, I don't know. I think it's just a brand name. As far as I know, it's not an English word. And he said the young people there love wearing it because it was a really dirty word there. It was a really dirty word. And the young people thought that was funny. It actually meant it's the command form of the verb to have anal sex. I know this is, I told you this was going to be dirty. <laughs> That's what, so, ever, so then after he told me that I couldn't, Every time I saw people walking around with Bila stuff on, it was like, have anal sex. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> and you would see young people wearing it like, this is cool, right? Like somebody put this on a shirt. I know, Dion. Yes, John. Yes, that's what he said it meant. It was a, it, so it's, in Swahili, a verb has ku on the front. Um, and if you drop the ku, the ku, then it's the command form of the word. So it was like, without the command anyway uh it's kind of funny maybe you guys won't think it is funny when i was younger i thought that was really funny yeah somebody says that specific i know i thought so too i was like you have a verb for that <laughs> that's so weird there were so many funny language things that happened there i'm sure those of you who speak more than one language or uh i'm not i'm not a, a especially talented with languages. Um, my husband is. Some people just have that talent. Um, but Swahili was was great, and I took it for a long enough time. And also, I think it was much easier for me to learn that than something like French, which I tried to learn and was too difficult. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, if you if you do speak other languages or if you've ever traveled out of country a lot, I'm sure you have those moments of just, there was another one just real, this I'll tell in a much faster. There were so many of these moments. It's just the funny language things. Are, at times I was with other students from other colleges and then we would go off on our separate projects for like a month and then come back. And we had a American uh, Mualimu teacher and we had a Tanzanian a Mualimu and our American teacher who's kind of over the whole group, you know, he wasn't always with us. He was only with us when we were together as a group. He had told us, we, if you go to a nightclub, like the men are very sexually aggressive or they'll hit on you anyway, all the time. And um, you just tell them I'm married and they'll usually stop. They respect that. And so uh, there are three different verbs there that are very similar. It's like kulewa, kuolewa, and kuelewa. So it's just the difference of one letter in each of those words. And, oh gosh, it's been a long time. I don't know if I remember which is which. But they basically, they mean to be married or to be drunk or to understand. And so he had said, you know, make sure you say I'm married and they'll stop. So we one night in Moragora, we had gone to this kind of bar. And this one guy just kept like dancing up on me and getting soaked and i i kept i thought i was saying i'm married i'm married and he was going me me pia me me too and i'm like this isn't working i went and told, I went and told the teacher of the molly i was like i kept saying i'm married and he just kept saying me too and dancing more and he he finally was like well how, what did you say and he was like oh no 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 you told him you were drunk <laughs> so that was like another like ah i love those moments i want to have more of those i want to travel more because language language faux pas or accidents I don't, there's something so funny about those and did he mean hashtag me too no he, he just meant i'm drunk too let's keep let's do this <laughs> uh okay that was a fun unexpected story time okay i am gonna wrap this up i need to go help with mudding Thank you. Elsa Barrett for the $10 Canadian $10 super chat says don't change their kerfefe and don't change the theme song. It's awesome. Well, thank you very much. I guess I should look at the results of the poll. So for the theme song, 87% do like the intro song and 13% don't. 
okay, I think I'll probably keep it for the time being. But uh, at some point we might change it. And like I said, my husband, we want to do some other kinds of songs too that we use, especially for games and funny segments on pop culture on Wednesdays. So well, I'll let you know. I had fun hanging out with you guys today. If you like the show, do the things people say, hit the like button, it helps, or leave a comment. And um, thank you to the mods for helping. I am... As I mentioned, going to be traveling. I'm going to be hanging out with friends this week. Uh, Chrissy Mayer, the comedian's having another fun content house where she brings together different kinds of streamers and and does um, like live streaming there. And I know I'm going to get to see X-Ray Girl. I might be able to do some special videos from there, but just for now, assume our regular schedule. Let's say it's an early Christmas week. Not going to be doing regularly scheduled Wednesday or Friday show. Um, but uh, I'll let you know in the community page. Thank you guys for hanging out. And I will talk to you later. I hope you have a great week.